This video was heavily inspired by Spectrum, who usually ranks the rulers of major European countries on his channel. If you're a history connoisseur, you should definitely check out his videos. After watching this one, of course. If you know of Serbia, you know that it doesn't really fall into the category of major European states, but in my opinion deserves recognition for having an equally rich and interesting history. It evolved from a loose federation of pagan tribes, to a mighty empire, then to an Ottoman subject state, and then to the absolute mess that was Yugoslavia throughout its millennia and a half of existence. So, the Serbian monarchy went through a lot, and if I started counting all the men and women who claimed the throne of Serbia, I would be here for days. In this ranking, I will include only the rulers of most prominent Serbian states throughout the ages, starting with Selimir and ending with Peter II. I will not be including kings of Bosnia and princes of Montenegro, like I originally wanted to, because I don't want this video to be too long and confusing. I will include only monarchs of sovereign Serbian states, so the titular despots, regents and rebel leaders, except for two, will not be ranked. I will include anti-kings as well. That leaves us with 65 rulers, so let's get started immediately. Number 65 and 64, Radoslav and Prosigui. They were the successors of Vyshaslav. The only thing we know about them is their names, so I can't really talk about them much. Number 63, Desislav. The only woman on this list. She held the title after her husband Mikhailo was killed in battle by Stefan Nemanja. She was a titular monarch who lived out the rest of her days in exile. Number 62, Milan Obrenović II. The shortest ruling monarch in Serbian history. He was born a sickly child and he died a sickly teenager. He was said to be somewhat smart, but during his only 26 days of reign, he never really got to do anything. Number 61, Dobroslav. Ruled even shorter than the nephew he overthrew. He was removed from power after less than a year by his relative, with the help of the Rashkan Prince Vukas. Number 60, Tihomir. Mostly known for being the older brother of Stefan Emanja, with whom he fought a civil war. He lost a battle to his brother and drowned in a river while trying to escape. Number 59, Peter II. He became king at the age of 11, after his father was assassinated by the Ustasha. His regency, led by his uncle Prince Paul, made some very retarded decisions, such as forming the Croatian Banovina and practically handing all the power in the country to the Ustasha. When the regency decided to join the Axis powers, the Brits staged a coup. A pro-British general proclaimed a 17-year-old Peter old enough to rule and withdrew Yugoslavia from the Axis. Now, the funny mustache man didn't like that one bit, so he decided it was time for Yugoslavia to be removed from existence. Yugoslavia was conquered in 11 days and Peter fled to London. He gave support to the Chetniks at the start of the war, but when the partisans gained the upper hand, he renounced his support for the Chetnik movement and tried to warm up to Tito. Tito was having none of it, however, and he revoked the king's citizenship and forbid him forever returning to Yugoslavia. Peter lived out the rest of his days in obscurity, developing alcoholism and abusiveness. He died at the age of 47. Number 58, Pribislav. Reigned for very short. As soon as he came to power, his cousin overthrew him and exiled him into Croatia. Number 57, Goislav. For a while, he ruled jointly with his mother. He set out to hunt down and kill a guy called Lutovit, but was wounded in the hunt. As he laid wounded in bed, some men came into his tent and assassinated him. His brothers avenged him later. Number 56, Stefan Tomasevic. He was a Bosnian prince who managed to marry a Serbian princess and get the despotate as dowry. However, he only held Serbia for two months. The people didn't like him because he was a Catholic, and soon enough, the Turks came in. He surrendered Smederevo without a fight and returned back to Bosnia. Number 55, Belos. He didn't reign for long. He surrendered the title and returned to Hungary, where he served the king as the Palatine. Number 54, Mihailo II, ruled for only a year after Bodin's death. He was overthrown by the previously mentioned uncle Dobroslav. Number 53, Kočapar. Essentially a puppet for the Rashkan prince Vukan, who placed him on the throne. When the relations between them worsened, Vukan had him overthrown. Number 52, Stefan Konstantin. The second son of King Milutin, who he named heir after blinding his eldest son Uroš. After Milutin died, Uroš proclaimed himself the rightful king and the two brothers fought a civil war. In Serbia, he is considered a usurper, but honestly, I think his anger was justified. Uroš proved to be a good ruler, but Konstantin was the legitimate heir and had the right to fight for his claim. Though, trying to assert yourself in your home country with an army of foreign mercenaries isn't really a good idea if you don't want to look like an invader. He was killed in battle against his older brother. Number 51, Radoslav Gradišnić, son of Gradihna. He gave up his title of king of Serbia and ruled only as a prince of Dukle, a weak ruler who held no power over the nobility. He was even overthrown by the nobles, and his seat was for a while given to a Rashkan prince. He was given his title back when the Byzantines intervened, 
but he continued ruling over a weak and decentralized realm where the nobles held the most power. Number 50. Mikhailo III The son of Radoslav and the last ruler of Duklia. His reign ended when Stefan Emanja barged into his lands and defeated him in battle. Number 49. Uros II His reign was one of the divide among the nobility. He fought wars against the Byzantines, but he lost and had to swear fealty to the Tsar. Afterwards, the members of the ruling dynasty split into two groups. One who opposed their new overlords and wanted an alliance with Hungary, and the other with the Urosh on his center, that supported the Greeks. In the end, the same emperor that Urosh supported so loyally had him removed from power, and named his brother prince instead. Number 48. Marko Mnjavcevic Because Urosh the Weak was infertile and could have no sons, and his father Vukashin was the Tsar's co-ruler and the most powerful man in the realm, Marko was named heir to the empire. Unfortunately, his father, his uncle and the Tsar all died in 1371, and since literally no one in Serbia liked him, his claim was immediately dismissed. He ruled over a small realm centered in South Macedonia as an Ottoman vassal until he was killed in 1395 at the Battle of Rovina. He was a gloomy and brooding man who served as a vassal to the Turks in order to spare the local Serbs from the Ottoman mistreatment. An idealized version of him is prominent in many Serbian epic songs, but the real Marko, despite being noble, wasn't nearly as significant as the Serbs remember him to be. Number 47. Stefan Uroš V or Uroš the Weak he just didn't live up to expectations. He was described as a weak-willed and unprepared young man when he took power, and he remained that way until his very death. Under him, local lords who grew very powerful under his father asserted their autonomy and the Tsar had to rely on the most powerful ones in order to actually stay in power. He gave away titles to anyone who had an army, not because he wanted to, but because he had to. The best example of this was Bukashin Mrnjavčević, who grew so powerful that Uroš had to name him his co-ruler and king, and also name his son Marko Heir. The Tsar himself wasn't ready for rulership, and the fact that the opposition to him was so strong doesn't help at all. Under different circumstances, Urosh wouldn't have been considered nearly as bad. In my opinion, even though he was a weak ruler, he was much more of a victim of unfortunate circumstances than anything else. Number 46. Stefan Brankovic Reigned for only about a year. When his brother died without male children, he managed to get the throne, despite being blind and not all that competent. His rule was also undermined by his brother's widow, who had managed to have him replaced. He lived out the rest of his days in exile, not really having accomplished anything of note. Number 45. Jovan Uroš He was the son of Simeon Senesha and inherited his Tsardom when he died. However, he was a very timid and unambitious man, also very pious and much more suited for monastic life. He reigned for only two years before he left for a monastery. He was the last male ruler of the Nemanjic dynasty. Number 44. Desa He was supposedly very popular and after his brother Belos resigned he took over. He had positive relations with Hungary and Western Catholic countries, so the Byzantines thought that he had to go. He was imprisoned and replaced by either his cousin or his son Tihomir. Number 43. Vukan He had the shortest reign out of all the Nemanic rulers. He was envious because his younger brother got the throne instead of him, so with the help of the Hungarians he had him deposed. The people saw him as a usurper and a traitor. It didn't really help his reputation that he planned to convert the Serbs into Catholicism. So when his younger brother came back from Bulgaria to reclaim the throne, the people chose his side. Vukan was smart enough to understand that he was screwed, so he gave his brother the throne back and was allowed to return to his holdings. Most people don't really count him when they talk about Serbian rulers, but he did reign for two years, and his ascension to power showed that Serbia was still vulnerable to the whims of outside forces. Number 42. Uroš I He was an ally of Duklan King Georgi, and with his help he managed to gain power in Rashk. He proved himself capable enough, but he would constantly be endangered by the Byzantines and the Hungarians. He tried to play the diplomacy game by marrying his daughters to powerful Hungarian nobles, but those marriages didn't really bear fruit. Number 41. Stefan Radoslav He ruled as regent while his father was ill and after he died he only managed to rule for six years. What kept him in power was an alliance with the despot of Epirus, to whose daughter he was married. He could be described in modern terms as a simp and a cuck because his wife's decisions dictated his actions but she left him for another man as soon as he was removed from power. He was also in conflict with his uncle Seid Sauer for some undescribable reason and he was very disliked by both the nobility and his younger brother, due to the fact that he considered himself more of a Greek than a Serb. He was deposed by said brother and exiled, but Sava advocated him and managed to secure his return. He lived the rest of his life as a monk. Number 40. Stefan Vladislav II Son of Dragutin, who inherited his kingdom of Sirmia. However, as soon as Dragutin kicked the bucket, Milutin burst in and threw Vladislav in jail, where he remained for about five years. When Milutin died, he managed to escape and re-establish his realm and even was a pretender to the Serbian throne. He didn't reign for long though, because Dechanski quickly swooped in and subdued his country. Most Serbs forget that this guy even existed.
Number 39. Stefan Vladislav I. Just as Radoslav had been reliant to the Greeks, Vladislav relied heavily upon Ivan Asin II of Bulgaria, whose daughter he married. Just like his older brother, he was in conflict with his uncle Saint Sava, who for a while refused to crown him because he usurped his brother's throne. After Sava died, however, the king buried him with all respects and honors that he deserved. Vladislav waged some wars with Hungary and Dubrovnik, but his rule came crashing down as soon as Ivan Asin died and the Mongols conquered Bulgaria. The nobles rebelled and placed his younger half-brother Uros on the throne. The only memorable thing he left behind was Milesha Monastery, one of the most beautiful pieces of religious architecture in Serbian history. Number 38. Lazar Branković He was the son of Juraj Branković and was very unremarkable. He co-ruled with his father for a few years and ruled independently for only a year and a half. He was somewhat influential in Hungary, but in Serbia he was often undermined by his ambitious wife and decisions that he made on his own, like poisoning his mother and exiling his siblings, weren't very wise to say the least. His only success was getting Mehmed II to agree to not invade Serbia for the rest of Lazar's lifetime. So for about a year. Number 37. Vladimir Replaced Kochapar and managed to reign for quite a while, due to him being on good terms with Vukan. After a while, Vukan and Bodin's widow grew tired of him so they had him poisoned. Number 36. Pavel Branovic He was a Bulgarian puppet. The Byzantines didn't really like that, so they sent an army to replace him with his pro-Greek cousin Zaharia. That excursion failed, but when Pavel started getting close with the Byzantines, the Bulgarian Tsar Simeon intervened and placed Zaharia on the throne instead. Number 35. Grubash He was placed on the Serbian throne after his father and brother staged a revolt against the King George. His reign was short, but peaceful, as he tried to rebuild the realm that had been ravaged by almost 20 years of dynastic conflicts. He was overthrown and Georgia came back with an army. Number 34. Gradikna Came to power when King Georgia was overthrown for the second and last time. His reign was one of consolidation after 30 years of unrest and dynastic battles, but also one of decentralization, as both Rashka and Bosna broke away. Gradikna was very reliant on the Byzantine Emperor, and gave in to Byzantine pressure to give up the title of king. Number 33. Simeon Sinisha he was the half-brother to Tsar Dushan. After his brother died and his nephew Urosh became Tsar, Simeon was very dissatisfied. So, this fucking guy takes over a city, locks himself in with literally zero soldiers and no support from the nobility whatsoever, and names himself the rightful Tsar. Unsurprisingly, nobody in Serbia liked that, but nobody considered him a serious threat, so they just let him be. As Urosh's power dwindled, Simeon actually managed to take over some lands and forge a realm of his own, and he would rule as anti-Tsar until he died in 1371 the same year as his arch nemesis Urosh. He was a capable ruler, but an unpleasant and bad man. Number 32. Alexander I. He had a very troubled reign. He ruled as regent for his father Peter I because of his old age and came to power after his death. He ruled over a deeply divided country, and like Tito after him he tried to keep Yugoslavia together. While Tito managed to heal the divides for a while, Alexander wasn't able to do so. He was a supporter of the idea that Serbs, Croats and Slovenes were one people with three names, which wasn't true and was very damaging to all three nations. Croats proved themselves to be very unruly and undermined the government at every opportunity they got, trying to break away from the Union. After a series of accidents, revolts and a period of political unrest, he tried to calm everyone down by temporarily disbanding the government and declaring a dictatorship with himself and its center. He ruled as a dictator for a short while before re-establishing the government but even still he was assassinated by a Macedonian revolutionary with the help of the Nazis and the Croatian Ustasha. Alexander could have been a good ruler if he ruled over Serbia, but due to Yugoslavia being such a shit show of a country he was out of luck. Number 31. Georgi Bodinovic Son of Bodin, who was placed on the throne by his mother after she poisoned the previous King Vladimir. His first reign ended when he was captured by a Kuman general and his uncle Goislav. He escaped prison and came back with an army, replacing Grubasha who was put in his place. He managed to subdue Rashka because Vukan had recently died, and his successors weren't nearly as capable as him. His second reign was mainly characterized by the power struggle between him and his relatives Dragila and Radikna, who managed to defeat him and imprison him. Number 30. Vishaslav A descendant of Selimir. He was an ally of the Byzantines and helped them in wars against Bulgaria and Charlemagne. Not much else is known about him. Number 29. Jovan Vladimir A pious, just and peaceful ruler who was unjustly murdered. He didn't stand out as an excellent statesman or a mighty conqueror, but he was renowned for his piety and righteousness. He was married to Samuel's daughter Kosara, who was his closest advisor. He was deceived and murdered by Ivan Vladislav, his wife's cousin. He is hallowed as a martyr and was the first Serb to be venerated as a saint. Despite him being an Orthodox Christian, his cult of personality is also strong among many Catholics and even some Muslims of Northern Albania. Number 28. Selimir Very little is known about this guy, but he is considered to be the founder of Balkan Serbia. He supposedly took half the Serbs from
from their ancient homeland of White Serbia, which is in today's Germany, and settled them in Raška, Bosnia and Dalmatian coast. This is a theory I personally don't believe in, but for the sake of this video let's say it's true. Selimir created the first tribal organizations and had the Romans that still lived in the land Serbs conquered paid access to him. He seemed to have been a good ally of the Byzantine Emperor, but was still a pagan and believed in the supremacy of his Slavic gods. If he existed, he was a very important figure. Number 27. Derwan The first known Serbian ruler. Unlike the rest of the monarchs on the list, he didn't actually rule in the Balkans. He actually ruled the Serbs in what is today Germany and what used to be called White Serbia. He was a tribal leader and a mighty warrior who at first accepted Frankish rule but later rebelled and joined the Slavic king Samu. He supposedly died in battle with the Frankish duke but even in death he made sure the Franks remembered him. He also might have been the brother of Selimir, who is credited with settling the Serbs in the Balkans. Number 26. Petar Gojniković He overthrew his cousins and took power for himself. Said cousins came back later to rebel against him, but he beat them and ruled in relative peace and stability for about 20 years. He improved relations with new Bulgarian ruler Simeon until he conspired with the Byzantine Emperor against him. Simeon defeated said Byzantine Emperor in a battle and then went against Petar. Petar stepped down and he saw that he couldn't defeat Simeon in battle and died as a prisoner in Bulgaria. After him many of his kinsmen would be placed on the Serbian throne as either Byzantine or Bulgarian puppets. Number 25. Zaharia Placed on the Serbian throne by Simeon. However, immediately after his ascension he allied himself with the Byzantines. By this point Simeon was pretty tired of dealing with the Serbs, so he sent his armies to straight up conquer Serbia this time. Zaharia however managed to repel his armies and kill his generals, whose heads he sent to the Byzantine Emperor as gifts. Simeon did send another army later however, and this time Zaharia had to flee to Croatia, where he probably helped Croatian rulers in their expansion. Number 24. Alexander Karadjordjevic Son of Karadjordj He was elected as prince by the National Assembly after the removal of the Obrenovic dynasty. Serbia was mostly ruled by the Ustavobranitelj government and the Karadjordjevic prince was mostly, but not completely, sidelined. Under him many educational institutions were founded, the army was modernized and a new codex of civil rights was passed. He helped Serbs in Hungary during the 1848 revolution and it was during his reign on the famous foreign policy program that Serbia followed up until the end of the century Nacertanje was written. He ruled during the peak of Ustavobranitelj rule and he eventually got sick of their shit, so they promptly kicked him out of power and out of the country altogether and brought back Miloš Obrenović. Bonus entry, Jovan Nenad. He isn't numbered because they completely forgot him and realized that very late. He proclaimed the second Serbian empire. He became very popular among Hungarian Serbs and rallied them under his banner. During the succession crisis between Ferdinand von Habsburg and John Zapolje, he played both sides and came to control most of what is today Vojvodina. He was an excellent general and an aspiring leader who beat the armies of John Zapolje on multiple occasions. His reign wasn't very long, however, because he was assassinated by one of Zapolje's men. His army scattered soon after. However, the many victories of Jovan Nenad allowed Ferdinand von Habsburg to assert his dominance over Zapolje and gain control over Hungary. Number 23. Stefan Dragutin After deposing his father, Dragutin proved himself as not nearly as capable as him. Dragutin had very little diplomatic skill and was much better at leading armies than running a country. He became reliant on the King of Hungary and the nobility's opinion on him quickly deteriorated. They probably wanted to stage an uprising against him, but before they could he fell off his horse during a hunt and broke his leg. Since he could no longer lead his troops, he abdicated in favor of his younger brother Milutin and carved out a piece of northern Serbia called Sirmia for himself to rule as its king. He helped his brother fight the Mongols, and then he fought his brother. He tried to place his son on the throne of Hungary after the death of the last Arapat king, but that went as well as you could expect. He died a monk soon afterwards. Number 22. Bodin Second Serbian king and the first Serb who wore the title of Tsar. He was elected the Bulgarian emperor during the short-lived Slavic uprising in 1071 but was captured and imprisoned. He would be imprisoned by the Byzantines on multiple occasions, but each time he managed to escape. When his father died, he struggled with his uncle Radoslav and later his nephews. He warred with Byzantium a few times, but never very successfully. He reigned during the First Crusade, and he even became blood brothers with the crusader leader Raymond of Toulouse. He expanded his kingdom and incorporated lost Serbian lands like Raška and Bosnia, assigning his relatives as their regents. The regents of Raška, Vukan, overshadowed his sovereign and was feared and respected much more than Bodin. Number 21. Alexander Obrenović His first act as king was dismissing the assembly and the government and creating a new one led by his political allies. He ruled absolutely, which was a tradition all Obrenović rulers respected. He was popular at the start of his reign for exerting dominance over the government, but later his popularity declined due to bad relations with Russia and good relations with Austria. He dismissed the legitimate government ten times, changed the constitution thrice and even abolished the constitution once. 
His most unpopular decision was marrying a widow from an unpopular family. Tired of his autocratic rule and probably with help from the side, a group of conspirators killed him, his wife and their unborn child in what is today known as the May Coup. Very unfortunate because this guy showed competence despite being a dictator. Number 20. Milan Obrenovic The father of Alexander and the successors of Prince Mihailo. His reign was a mixed bag. He restored Serbia's full independence, elevated Serbia into a kingdom once again and expanded the realm into the south. He was a jovial patriarch that had his country's best interests in mind. He created the first standing army and invested a lot of money into cultural institutions. However, he was paranoid and tried to take away people's guns so they wouldn't rebel. That made them rebel and he had to back down. He fought an unsuccessful war with the Ottomans and later fought another one that he won with Russian support. Then he started a war with Bulgaria that he somehow lost and his popularity quickly declined. After the San Stefano Treaty, relations between Serbia and Russia worsened and many assassination attempts were made on Milan. Tired of ruling, Milan abdicated and left the crown to his underage son. Number 19. Đuraj Branković Son of the infamous Vuk Branković and nephew of Stefan Lazarević. After a brief succession struggle with his uncle, he reconciled with Stefan and was named his heir due to him not having any children. The reign of Đuraj wasn't very prosperous, to say the least. Đuraj spent almost every single year of his life at war and died of an infected wound at the age of 79. He was a great warrior and he could be described as a wise ruler, but the circumstances he found himself in were less than ideal. The Turks were keen on conquering Serbia after Lazarević died and managed to do that for a short time between 1439 and 1444. Juraj was reinstated after the Battle of Varna, but it was all downhill from there. Juraj fought desperately to keep Serbia's independence and actually managed to succeed in that, but he left Serbia a war-torn and half-destroyed state that didn't outlive him for long. He was wealthy, but an unfortunate and sober despot whose reign was marked with death and decay. He was the right man for the time, who managed to go against all the odds and keep afloat a state which was running on borrowed time for 70 years now. It's surprising how well he actually did. Number 18. Vlastimir The first Serbian ruler who we have a substantial amount of knowledge about. He was certainly an ally to the Byzantines, but it's unclear whether he was a Christian or not. As a Byzantine ally he helped in the war against the Bulgars and later fought the same Bulgars on his own, holding out for three years and winning by depleting their resources and killing most of their army. He expanded Serbia by incorporating other smaller Serbian principalities and gave these lands to his family members and allies. He was generally good, but unfortunately we don't know too much about him. Number 17. Mutimir Vlastimir's eldest son and heir. He co-ruled with his brothers until they rebelled against him, probably under Greek influence. He also fought a war with Bulgarians and won, after which the two states became allies. He was very capable and ruled for over 40 years. He was also the first Serbian ruler who is known to have converted to Christianity and under him the long process of Christianization of the Serbs began. Number 16. Mihail. One of the many sons of Stefan Vojislav who managed to put himself above all his brothers. He came to power with Greek support but later allied himself with the Normans and the Pope. The Pope even granted him the title of king due to becoming a Catholic after the Great Schism. He meddled in Byzantine internal affairs and sent his son to be the leader of a great Slavic uprising against the Greeks. He used the Great Schism wisely, managed to subdue all opposition and significantly expand his realm. Number 15. Vojislav He was a cunning and deceitful ruler who used his wits and willingness to break rules to expand his realm. One time he met with a Greek general under banner of truce, broke the truce and had him in prison. To be fair though, said Greek general planned to do the same thing to him, Vojislav was just faster. He was the nephew of Ivan Vladimir and managed to get hold of his uncle's realm, first as a vassal of the Byzantines and then as an independent ruler. After he rebelled against the Greeks, they captured him and put him in jail, but he managed to escape and stage another rebellion. He refused to meet the Byzantines on the battlefield, but when they started getting tired of chasing him, he ambushed them in the night and killed most of the soldiers and generals. After that, the Byzantines just let the Serbs be. Unfortunately, he didn't outlive this great victory much, dying only four years later. Number 14. Stefan Dechansk A very unfortunate ruler. He rebelled against his father and lost, so his dad blinded him and sent him into exile. He was allowed to return after many years, and after Milutin died he managed to gain the support of the church and the nobility. He proclaimed himself firstly not blind and secondly the rightful king of Serbia. He defeated both his rival claimants Vladislav and Konstantin and reigned for a good nine years. He meddled in Byzantine civil wars and fought Bosnia and Dubrovnik. He managed to defeat the Bulgarian-Roman alliance in the Battle of Velbrž, which was the final proof that Serbia had become the hegemon of the Balkans. However, because of his indecisiveness and because he didn't want to take the throne of Bulgaria after Derzar was killed in battle, the nobility conspired against him. The final straw was when he, on the instance of his wife, wanted to remove his very popular son and heir Dushan and replace him with his eldest son from his second wife, Simeon Sinish. 
the nobility and Dusha staged an uprising and captured Dechansky, who died in jail under mysterious circumstances. He was a pretty good ruler, at times unambitious and indecisive, but overall competent and very well liked. He was just overshadowed by his holy father, King Milotin, and his mighty son, Tsar Dushan. Number 13. Vukan He was a relative of King Bodin and was granted Rashka to govern in Bodin's name. He proved himself more than capable, as he came to overshadow his king and largely acted independently. He was feared by the Byzantines, as he would frequently raid and pillage Greek lands near the border. His authority can be further proven by the fact that he himself negotiated with the Roman Emperor and treated him as his equal. When the Byzantines tried to subdue his state, he defeated them in battle and secured his rule. After Bodin died, he was the de facto ruler of his kingdom and played a part in the succession crisis that emerged. Pretenders to the throne vied for his support and when they stepped out of line, he would support their rivals. Overall, a very powerful leader. It's a shame that his successors were rather weak. Number 12. Chaslav He was the last of the Vlastimirovich rulers of Serbia. He spent most of his life in Bulgaria as a prisoner, but when Simeon died, he managed to escape and return to Serbia. Serbia had recently been completely ravaged by the Bulgarians and heavily depopulated. Still, with some monetary aid from the Greeks, Chaslav managed to reunite the lands of his ancestors. His country grew in size and when the Hungarians sat under the Pannonian Basin, Serbia was strong enough to repel them. A wife of one Hungarian warlord was very pissed that her husband was killed in battle with Chaslav so she demanded from her king to send his entire army to avenge her husband. That he did, and Chaslav and his soldiers had been caught off guard. Chaslav was captured, tied up and thrown into the Sava River. He didn't sink to the bottom because of the weight of his chains, but rather because of the weight of his huge balls. Number 11. Mikhail Obrenovich A true European gentleman. After his younger brother Milan died shortly after he assumed power, the underage Mikhail took over with the regency set up to rule for him. Said Regency didn't like him because he resembled his father way too much, so they overthrew him and exiled him along with his entire family. After some 20 years in exile, he came back after his father was re-elected and succeeded him when he died. He was an enlightened despot. He received education in Western European countries, where he picked up many enlightened ideas and became very skilled in diplomacy. He managed to purge the Turks from Serbia and remove Turkish garrisons from major Serbian cities. He also had an idea of forming a Balkan alliance to push back the Turks, but that idea never worked out. He was somewhat of a philosopher as well. Despite being very enlightened, he still ruled absolutely, which made him unpopular with certain political groups. Because of that, he was assassinated while walking down the street. Mihala was a true European ruler that had grand ideas how to elevate Serbia into a serious European country. Shame really that his reign was cut so short. Number 10. Uroš the Great He wasn't called great for nothing. He took the throne after the deposition of his younger half-brother Vladislav, and unlike his brothers, he held the throne for about 30 years. He didn't expand the country's borders by much, but instead he solidified Serbia's independence and forged major alliances with neighboring states. He also welcomed the Saxons into Serbia, after they had been driven out of Transylvania by invading Mongols. This proved to be his best decision, since Saxons were incredibly skilled in mining and processing ores. Under Uros, the Serbian economy would skyrocket, and Serbia for the first time started minting its own coins. Uros and his wife were beloved by the people, due to their philanthropy and willingness to help the common folk. Uroš successfully defended Serbia from Mongols, but he wasn't very successful in fighting against the Hungarians. The nobility started disliking him after a while, due to his efforts to centralize the government and take many rights away from them. He was overthrown by his son and died a monk, but he left a great legacy due to his political prowess and economic genius. Number 9. Peter I Out of all our rulers, he was the most beloved one by the people. He has the epithets of the old king and the liberator, but he is more commonly known by the nickname Chikopera, meaning Mr. Pete. He came to power after the May coup that killed Alexander Obrenovich at the age of 59, so he was pretty old when he assumed power. Serbia prospered under him. He didn't train as an absolute monarch like the Obrenovich. Press became free and the opposition faced much less oppression. The standard of living for the Serbian peasant increased and due to his kind-hearted nature the Serbs loved him. He oversaw the two Balkan wars, both of which Serbia won. He received an education in the West and had good relations with France and Britain, while still being on very good terms with Russia. Austria was the only downright enemy Serbia had for a while. As he grew older, he realized that he wasn't as capable as he used to be, so he kept the crown, but let his son Alexander rule in his stead. However, as soon as World War I came a knocking, he came back from retirement and would regularly visit the soldiers on the front lines, shouting at them words of encouragement while they fought. The presence of the king heavily boosted morale and made the soldiers adore him even more. And when Serbia was attacked from three sides and the army had to retreat through Albania, the now 70-year-old King Peter packed his stuff and walked through Albania with the soldiers and refugees. 
unlike his son and members of government who took a car ride to their destination. So, a 70-year-old man with failing health walked over hundreds of miles through the frozen peaks of Albanian mountains, willing to die alongside his soldiers. When the army reached the island of Corfu, his physical health was very bad, and he remained on the island for the rest of the war. And after all that, he deserved a vacation. And then, when the war was won, he came back and ruled Yugoslavia as king for three more years until his death. Number 8. Lazar When Maniatovic was killed at Marica in 1371 and Uroš the Wick died shortly after, a power vacuum appeared in Serbia, and the man who filled it was Prince Lazar. He was the son of a humble servant of Dušan and was also his cupbearer. From his humble beginnings, Lazar managed to work his way up the noble hierarchy and forged the most powerful Serbian realm. He was married to Milica Nemanic, a very distant relative of the royal family, and had a whole bunch of daughters with her. He made major political alliances by marrying off his daughters to powerful Serbian and Hungarian nobles, the most significant of which was Vuk Branković, the second most powerful man in ex-Serbia. Lazar was also allied to the Bosnian king Stefan Tvrtko and didn't contest Tvrtko's claim to the throne of Serbia. He kept to Nemanic's traditions and built many monasteries. He was said to be very pious and humble, a leader who valued his wealth and power because he worked hard to earn it. What makes him even more special is his death. When the Turks invaded in 1389, Lazar mustered all the soldiers Serbia had to offer, called to arms his son-in-law Vuk and his ally Tvrtko, and rode out to meet the Turks on the battlefield at the age of 60. He commanded the Serbian army himself at the legendary Battle of Kosovo and died fighting. As we say here, our holy Tsar Lazar gave up his earthly kingdom and on Kosovo filled ascended to the kingdom of God along with all the brave Serbs who died in that battle. Lazar is undeniably one of our best rulers, and the cult of his personality is still very strong. Number 7. Karadžoj The legend who led the first Serbian uprising. He was unanimously elected to be the leader because of his long history of defying the Turks and for his uncompromising nature. He was a strict leader who didn't tolerate disobedience. His father, who tried to switch sides and join the Ottomans, and his brother, who raped an innocent woman, felt on their skin that Karadžoj's rule applied for everyone. He was a serious man, prone to drinking and outbursts of violence, but that made him respected among the Serbs who worshipped him. He led his men on the battlefield and many Turks died by his blade and pistol. What is more, he was a massive man, tall and wide, with an iconic mustache. Karadžoja didn't do much ruling, however. He was a military general and a rebel leader, not a sophisticated statesman. He left the organization of the country to better suited people, while on the battlefield he ruled absolutely and demanded complete obedience. After the uprising was quelled, he fled to Austria and later to Russia, where he lived in melancholy and depression. But as soon as the second Serbian uprising kicked off, he came back. Miloš Obrenović had him assassinated because he was a threat to his authority. Karadžoj is legendary. He is considered the father of modern Serbia who revived the Serbian spirit and sparked an era of defiance against the Ottomans. Despite him not being a very conventional, intelligent man or a wise statesman, he is a folk hero who many Serbs look up to to this very day. Number 6. Milutin the much more politically savvy and also ruthless brother of Dragutin. He is known as the Holy King because each year he reigned he built or renewed a monastery and was a zealous Orthodox Christian. However, he did some not so pious acts, such as imprisoning his nephew, blinding his own fucking son after he rebelled and marrying five times, last time to a five-year-old girl. He created a strong standing army mainly consisting of Spaniards, instead of the realm into Byzantine lands, taking Skopje and Rač and asserted his dominance over all other Balkan states. The Romans and the Bulgarians feared him, the Hungarians and Mongols fought him and got the short end of the stick. He fought his brother Dragutin and his son Uroš, because he thought about replacing him as heir. Though he was at times merciless, with Milutin's taking of the throne, Serbia entered into a golden age and would cement itself as the Balkan superpower for the next 90 or so years. He reigned for the impressive 39 years, and as soon as he died, the country descended into civil war. Number 5. Miloš Obrenović A true patriarchal gentleman. He led the second Serbian uprising, where he proved himself not only as a skilled military general, but also a pragmatic negotiator. He secured Serbian autonomy inside the Ottoman Empire, and little by little managed to wrestle power away from Constantinople and place it wherever he currently was seated. Though he was illiterate, under him many cultural institutions and schools appeared in Serbia. Also, Serbia under him started to finally resemble an actual European country. He was an absolutist, not a stranger to intimidation tactics and beating his political rivals with clubs. His word was law, and he gave highest positions to his friends and political allies. He held on to absolute power for as long as he could, until he was forced by the assembly to limit himself and adopt a constitution. He was so despised by the assembly that they on several occasions rose up in rebellion, and eventually got powerful enough to vote him out. He was elected back to power at a very old age, but he didn't change much even after that. 
Despite being a piece of shit that would often suppress his opposition and not really improve the lives of his subjects, he was an intelligent ruler that took every opportunity to strengthen his state, and if it weren't for him, Serbia would probably not exist today. Number 4. Dusan the Mighty The first Serbian Tsar He came to power after overthrowing his father and started his reign off by conquering many Byzantine lands. Under him, Serbia would reach its peak territorial extent, stretching from the Danube to Achaea, and named Bosnia and Bulgaria as vassal states. Serbian military might reach its peak and as a generation of skilled generals and boyars came to lead the armies. Serbia was extremely wealthy under Dusan and could afford many mercenary armies. Dusan himself had a personal guard made up of Germans. Because of his conquest and his sheer power, in 1345 Dusan single-handedly elevated the Serbian archbishopric into a patriarchate and immediately the next year crowned himself emperor or Tsar of the Serbs and Romans. He was a great reformer of law, compiling the infamously cruel code of the pious emperor aka Dushan's Codex, which applied for everybody, from the lowest of pheasants to the highest of nobles. He was a skilled politician who meddled in Byzantine and Bulgarian affairs and had Byzantine pretenders vying to get his support. He was very ambitious, his wife was very ambitious and his court of advisors were very ambitious. However, Dushan died very suddenly in 1355, at about 50 years old and at the peak of strength and health. The cause of his death isn't confirmed yet, but I'm pretty certain that he was poisoned because of his next goal was to conquer Constantinople and proclaimed himself the actual Roman Emperor. Dusan was definitely our mightiest ruler, who ruled Serbia at its absolute peak. However, he did have his fair share of shortcomings, the most dire of which being his short-sightedness. Like Alexander the Great, he was a charismatic leader that was feared by all his enemies and beloved by his subjects, but as soon as he died, his entire realm fell apart. His generals and courtiers got too powerful and too greedy, and his successor ruler just couldn't keep them at bay. Even still, Dushan is considered by many as our best ruler, and understandably so. Numbers 3 and 2 Stefan Emanja and Stefan I crowned These two are so iconic that I just couldn't decide which one to put above the other. It is important for a ruler to leave behind a good heir, and if that doesn't happen then everything tends to fall apart after the ruler is gone. Take for example Dushan. These two are the exact opposite. Nemanja is the quintessential father of medieval Serbia, who broke free of Byzantine vassalage and expanded his realm by conquering Greek lands. He was brought to heal once more by the Emperor Manuel II, but as soon as he died Nemanja resumed his activities. He was a humble man who did value his pride, but knew when to swallow it if necessary. He was also pious to the point of being a zealot, and expelled all the heretics from his realm. He was a builder of great monasteries, and even abdicated near the end of his life in order to live out the rest of his days in the monastery, along with his youngest son Sava. His only short-sighted decision might have been leaving his throne to his second son instead of his eldest, but let's be real, Stefan was much better suited for rulership than Vukan. After Nemanja, Stefan continued his father's policy of making Serbia independent of Byzantium and asserting its original power. Stefan didn't expand the realm by much, but secured Serbia's independence by firstly skillfully using diplomacy and making allies with major European powers, and secondly by elevating his country into a kingdom with the blessing of the Pope. Also, during his reign the Serbian Orthodox Church became autocephalous, thanks to his brother Saint Sava. While Nemanja was a warrior king through and through, Stefan was a masterful diplomat, and thanks to these two men Serbia finally became free once again, and their efforts paved the way for Serbia's rise and golden age. Glory be to these two holy kings. Number 1. Stefan Lazarevic He inherited from his father Lazar the worst situation Serbia has ever found itself in, after the Battle of Kosovo. But Stefan was a whole different breed of ruler. He was well versed in geopolitics and diplomacy, mainly due to his mother Milica, God bless her. He never was rash and always carefully considered his actions before taking them. But when he made his decisions, he stuck to them until the very end. He accepted Ottoman vassalage and was loyal to the Sultan Bayezid, but after his death and the subsequent civil war, he found a strong ally in the Hungarian King Sigismund, whose close friend he would remain until his death. Due to their strong friendship, Sigismund even granted Lazar Belgrade, out of which he would make a true European city and an unbreachable fortress. He was also a brilliant military mind and proved himself on more than a few occasions, most importantly the Battle of Nicopolis and the Battle of Ankara. He was taught swordsmanship from a very early age and was one of the best knights of the time. And not only did he have combat skills of a knight, he was also chivalrous and just, a true protector of his people. He is one of the rare Serbian rulers who managed to subdue the nobles and he ruled as an enlightened despot for over 38 years. And not only was he a military expert, a diplomatic genius and a chivalrous knight, he was also an economic genius, under whom Serbia became one of the wealthiest countries in Europe. He reformed mining codes and law and even brought renaissance to Serbia for a short period of time. He was an inspiring poet as well, a patron of the arts and a builder of monasteries. This guy almost single-handedly took Serbia out of a dark, hopeless period and extended its lifespan for some 70 more years. 
Unfortunately, he died relatively young at the age of 50, suddenly and childless. Had he lived a full life, I am pretty certain that Serbia would have never been conquered by the Turks. Genuinely the best ruler that we've ever had. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Have mercy on me please, this is my first ever video and I have yet to figure out how YouTube works. I will probably make more since I find the process actually very enjoyable. Have a good day.